All right. Hi, everyone. Let's get started now. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us here tonight. I'm very excited to see everyone here and to learn more about the American Math Competition and also about college admissions. So tonight, we're going to hear from Matt Ro uh, Rosenbaum, who is the Chief of Staff here at Ingenious Prep and also a former admissions officer from the University of Chicago, as well as Wes Carroll, who is the principal of Wes Carroll Tutoring and Coaching and also is an expert in the math competition landscape. So without any further ado, I'll hand this off to Matt. Thanks, Cynthia, and super excited about today's programming. Uh, just a little bit more. Again, my name is Matt. I serve as the Chief of Staff at Ingenious Prep. I've been in the admissions space for a little bit over a decade, uh, which the last six years has included one-to-one -one coaching for students interested in preparing for and enrolling in some of the top schools in the U.S. Uh, but before that, I was an admissions officer at the University of Chicago, where my primary responsibility was to recruit and evaluate students for the undergraduate program. Um, academically, I have degrees in philosophy and business, and I'm super excited to be working with our co-panelist, Wes, uh, to bring you some information about the AMC. Matt, shall I take it? Yep, go for it. Uh, outstanding. Um, uh, it's lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Wes Carroll, of course. I've been running Wes Carroll Tutoring and Coaching for uh, going on 25 years now. We specialize in uh, coaching gifted kids, primarily high schoolers, of course. Uh, and the reason for that is that we find that uh, unusually ambitious and gifted kids um, have problems that are different from the problems that other kids have. Uh, and generally speaking, um, they're underserved in the market. So we're trying to give them uh, every opportunity to maximize their gifts. One of the ways that we do that is to help not only prepare them for the AMC, but help them decide whether it's an appropriate thing for them to grapple with. And if it is, to be smarter about it so that they can spend an appropriate amount of time getting uh, an excellent score and learning some skills along the way that will help them throughout college and beyond. Thanks, Wes, and we're excited to have you. Thanks. Um, we're we're going to start out today with uh, a little bit of an introduction to Ingenious Prep. Um, Ingenious Prep is an admissions consulting organization that works with students all over the world who are targeting some of the top schools in the US. Um, our process differentiates uh, our organization from other admissions consulting uh, companies sort of by three tiers. Number one is our counselors. We match students with former admissions officers from IV and IV plus schools, as well as graduate coaches from those schools. We have a curriculum that we've developed over the last decade that not only trains our counselors, but is also adaptable to students to meet them where they're at in terms of interests, skills, and talents. And then we've also invested in resources for students to not only take advantage of our counseling program, but also to participate in programs like our academic mentorship program, which is a research program, our leadership and innovation lab, which is an entrepreneurial incubator program, writing courses, and soft skills program. Every year we work with students who are admitted to some of the top schools like Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Hopkins, U Chicago, Yale, and more. Our team of former admissions officers uh, are made up of former admissions officers from multiple schools. You'll see on your screen as an example, my colleague Nicholas Stroll, who was an admissions officer at Yale, Nam Hartley, who was an admissions officer at Duke, and Natalie Ostrowski, who was a colleague of mine at the University of Chicago. By working with decision makers at some of the top schools, we are able to guide our students to better understand how and why students are admitted to their dream school, and ultimately what students can do to be successful and take advantage of all the resources at those dream schools. Other counselors are graduate coaches, are graduates from some of these top schools. Uh, for example, my colleague Omar from Dartmouth, Pia from Brown, and Christopher from Emory. As mentioned, students are also able to take advantage of research projects. Uh, we work with students on what we call academic mentorships, which are 12-week research programs where students work directly with professors on topics that interest them, and then ultimately will finalize a paper that they can prepare for publication. We do have a curriculum that follows students across different milestones that prepare them not only to help them build an application persona, which is the argument that they're going to be making to college, or the common thread that can be found in all components of the application. 
And we make sure that we guide students to build up strong evidence to support their argument within academics, within extracurricular activities, and then also within intellectual development. We develop a systematic and operational curriculum that is used to work with our students, train and manage our counseling team. And we do have the results. Last year, we worked with students who earned 86 Ivy League offers, 112 offers to top 10 schools, and 253 offers to top 20 schools. Over the last week and a half, I'm super excited to announce that our early decision and early action results include Brown University, Duke University, Harvard, MIT, Stanford, and pretty much all of the Ivy and Ivy Plus schools. Again, if you're interested in learning more about how we can potentially help your student, you can add Cynthia's WeChat, or you can email her. And if you're interested in more of what Wes offers through Wes Carroll Tutoring and Coaching, you can go on his website and there will be a QR code at the end of our conversation. Ingenious Prep offers multiple programs, including candidacy building, which is perfect for students age range eight, nine, 10, and 11th grade. We have application counseling, which are for 12th graders. And we have other programs like the Academic Mentorships, the Leadership and Innovation Lab, and much, much more. Okay, great. So before we move on, I just want to give everyone uh, some time and the opportunity to either write down my email up there or scan that QR code on the slides for my WeChat. So you want to reach out to me for scheduling that free admission strategy consultation, and I'll get that set up for you. Um, also, here is Wes's information. Uh, that is his website and his QR code. So reach out to him to learn more about how he can help you with DMC and also set up a consultation with him as well. Awesome. Thanks, Cynthia. Okay, let's get into the meat of our discussion, what I'm super excited about. You know, usually when we have webinars at Ingenious, they're very content driven. They're very much, um, hey, here, look at our PowerPoint, how we can help you. Um, but we're doing uh, things a little bit differently today, and we've invited uh, who I consider to be one of the foremost experts in sort of the AMC tutoring, um, and I've really enjoyed getting to understand his practice, and I'm super happy to, to be doing this with you, Wes. Um, so, Wes, why don't you Appreciate tell that, us a little bit, tell us a little bit largely, like, you know, number one, what is, you know, Wes Carroll uh, tutoring and coaching, and then we'll kind of get into the nuts and bolts. What's the AMC, et cetera? Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. So I think it's, it's fair to say that we're pretty unusual in that we're focusing on, like I say, kids who are gifted uh, and, or especially ambitious. And it's, it, it feels a little bit strange to talk about tutoring in that context, which is part of why we have coaching in our name. The notion is that coaching is the thing that you most need if you already have very high potential and you're trying to develop it. Because as you know, from your work, the system is not geared towards the folks who are out on the periphery, okay? If you have 10 students in a class and eight are sort of, you know, standard students and one is having trouble keeping up and one is racing ahead, we know which nine of those students is gonna tend to get the most attention. It's gonna start with the eight in the middle because that's what the class is geared towards. And then it's gonna be the one who's in danger of falling behind because of course we wanna make sure to bring him or her up to speed. Whereas the one who's at the front of the class, as it were, is never gonna be a problem, is never gonna be on anyone's radar. Uh, as someone who desperately needs attention, right? There's never going to be urgency there. And yet it's important uh, that everyone be able to learn as much as they possibly can. And from my perspective, it seems like if we're going to have someone who has potentially even greater gifts, it's on us to help them develop those gifts because that's going to benefit us all on down the road. So that's the that's the, that's the the why of uh, of our little firm. And then as far as the AMC goes, one of the things that's been really interesting for me in uh, in coaching for this exam for a long time and, and in being a competitor, you know, back in the day in the 1700s when I was in high school, is that um, it, it really gets into the kind of real world skills that you need after you're done with the academic, you know, uh, part of your career. After high school, after college, after maybe grad school, you're going to be in the broader world where people are going to ask you to do things that they don't have a recipe book for. Okay. And that's the point at which it's not enough to have taken the appropriate class and to have memorized the appropriate formula. You need to have some of the support skills that go into working through adversity that go into, okay, what do, what do I do when I don't know what I'm doing? How can I tell the difference between when I'm having a great day and when I'm merely having an okay day? These really matter if you're, uh, if you're grappling with very, very difficult challenges. And most of these kids don't have as much experience 
with very difficult challenges as their peers because most of school isn't challenging for them the way it is for their peers. So the thing about the AMC is that it, it lets them lean into developing that grit, some of those crucial support skills that everyone else gets just from taking calculus. So let's, let's, yeah, so let's take a step. Is, um, you know, West Carroll tutoring and coaching is really sure. emphasizing the coach. And we're talking about students who have a tremendous amount of potential, mm -hmm. um, but may not either be given the opportunity to unleash that at school, might not be challenged at school, and right. might need some expert level coaching to really hit um, their targets, whatever their targets might be, right? That's right. I think that we can think of this in, in sort of two different ways, right? The AMC provides some level of um, curriculum and certification, credentialing, if you like, around this stuff in the sense that you don't need me to get the school that, you're, that your kid goes to, or for that matter, your homeschool, right? To participate in the AMC such that, okay, now we've got sort of a pseudo curriculum that is de facto challenging. Okay, even the um, the sort of the junior level of the AMC, the AMC eight, the AMC ten, these junior levels are still very, very challenging. We get you know seventh and eighth graders participating in the AMC eight, who recognize that although everything in these questions is nominally stuff they've learned about in school, the way this test puts it together is different from the way a school test operates. So there's naturally challenge there. So that's that's the that's the one half. That's the structure piece. And then when it comes to when it comes to my practice, it really comes down to um, addressing the sorts of problems that these students typically tend to hit that other students might hit earlier, but which doesn't affect them. Okay. And that 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 basically falls into three different categories. I'll just I'll just get into it very briefly. Right. One of the things is obviously you have to know your stuff. And where uh, most of the students who do well at the AMC, just showing up at class is enough for them to absorb everything about the class in most of their classes. Okay, they don't need to do a lot of homework. They don't need to do a lot of studying. They showed up for the class. They were listening. They were paying attention. And now they know the material. And that's the way it works. Whereas the AMC material is different, which means you have to go out and learn some things that aren't being presented in class. Okay, and it's not that that's rocket science, but again, it can be unusual for these students. W what do you mean there's math I don't already know that I need for this thing? Okay, so that's that's one thing. Another thing that uh, that I think is is very important is, uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, the skill of knowing what to do when you don't know what you're doing. And the reason this is so important to these students is twofold. One is they're going to be in careers where they don't know what they're doing because you know, that's the that's the whole nature of being at the head of the pack is that you see the things first, right? The people at the back of the pack see it after you, whereas you're leading the charge into the unknown. You're doing research, you're doing <clears throat> entrepreneurship, whatever it is, but there isn't a playbook, generally speaking, for what you're going to be getting into. So it's important to do that. And yet these are the very people who aren't exposed to those skills early because they don't need it, right? They're the ones who can sort of look out on the horizon and say, oh, AP Calculus, okay, fine. I'll check out the book before I start the class or I'll talk to people who've taken the class before. I'll you know, check out Khan Academy, I'll figure out what I, or I'll just go in cold because it'll be fun and I'm sure it'll be fine, right? <clears throat> um, and so you know, really getting formal around, okay, how do you learn a new skill um, can be uh, enormously empowering. And then the- so let, let's, yeah, let's, yeah, let's, let's take, let's take, let's take sure, a step sure. back. So I, Sure, sure, sure. I, um, I, I like this idea that you said of, what do you mean I don't know this math? I should have <laughs> learned it in school. So walk sure. me through, walk me through, there's the AMC 8, yeah. there's the AMC 10, there's the AMC 12. Walk me through what the different levels are, what is being tested, and then why would a student take it? Like, what, what really is the point? Yeah, why bother? So, um, so nominally... The AMC 8 only covers math through 8th grade. AMC 10 only covers math through 10th grade. AMC 12 through 12th grade. Uh, by the rules of the competition, if you've, uh, you're only allowed to take the AMC 8 if you haven't finished 8th grade. You're only allowed to take the 10 if you haven't finished 10. You're only allowed to take the 12 if you haven't finished high school. Uh, but, but the opposite's not true. If you're a 7th grader, you're allowed to take the AMC 10, the AMC 12, and so on. Okay. So uh, the difference is AMC 8 is pre-algebra. 
AMC 10 is early algebra and geometry. AMC 12 is through pre-calculus. No is calculus. Was it? Do I have to take AMC 8 to take AMC 10? No, no uh, you can you can jump in at any point. And in fact, there are routinely students. Uh, so generally speaking, the AMC 8 is given once a year and the 10 and 12 are each given twice a year. There are students who will take, you know, uh, an, uh, uh, an AMC 10 and then an AMC 8 in the same year, you know, if they qualify for both exams, that's that's perfectly fine. The only other um, sort of difference from a, an administrative standpoint um, is that the uh, if you do very well on the 8, then you get a like a nice certificate. If you do really well on the 10 or 12 though, in addition to a certificate, they invite you to take the next level up exam, the so-called American Invitational Math Exam, which we call the AMI. And the idea here is that, um, that that in turn is the qualifying exam for international math Olympiads and so forth, okay? So there's this sort of ladder approach to it. And where <laughs> I, should, I should say, most students who are in this realm are just assuming they're going to get 100% on any test they take, right? Not, not so this one. And in fact, just making it to that second tier, the AIME is considered really quite a top honor. I mean, as, as a former admissions guy and a current admissions consultant, you understand that if you sure. can say, oh yeah, I made Amy, it's like, okay, that's instant credentialing in a way that you can't get from really any school. Right. So I get it, right? Uh, you know, I'm a math guy. I'm a STEM guy. Maybe I like physics, yeah. maybe I like engineering. And I'm going sure. after a AMC 8. And I'm going after AMC 10. And I'm going after AMC 12. Yeah. What, you know, number one, what does the preparation actually look like? Because from yeah. my perspective, after talking with you and after working with many students, it's not like you're preparing for the ACT. It's not like right. you can just take a bunch of practice tests and I'm going to go from a 32 to a 35 and all is good. It yeah. seems like even the even the sharpest students that I work with, the students who have the 4.0s and the students who, um, you know, really things tend to come easily to them, even they're hitting these huge roadblocks and they mm -hmm. can't get where they want. So right. talk me through kind of your approach to um, the preparation for the AMC at the different levels. And then talk me through this idea of, I'm hitting a wall, Wes. Why can't I just get into the AIME? Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So uh, one of the things that's so tricky about this is that preparation can look like a lot of different things. And I think one of the big mistakes that people uh, make when they run at this exam is they assume that counter to what you just said, eh, it's just a harder version of the ACT. So I'll just do what I would do for the ACT. I'll just do more of it. Now, that strategy can be successful in the sense that if you do a whole ton of practice tests, you will eventually learn the things you need to learn and you will do at least moderately well on this exam. The difference is you can learn to crush the ACT in some number of dozens of hours. Whereas if you want to do that to the AMC, it's going to take hundreds. And most of the people competing at this level don't have spare hundreds of hours for it because they're ambitious, bright kids who are doing a lot of challenging things, right? Even if they have the hours, you know, by the time they get around to AMC prep, their brain is empty, right? They need to go to sleep and, and all that kind of good stuff. So <clears throat> that's that's the first disconnect that happens is this idea of, oh, I'll just treat it like everything else. But the beautiful thing is, if you could just treat it like everything else, it wouldn't be that interesting an exam. It's the fact that it's different that makes it compelling in large part, okay? So what you got to do then is you got to say, okay, well, if I'm not going to do this the way I do everything else that I'm successful at, then what am I going to do? <clears throat> and that's where you get into um, some of the heuristics and strategies that have been around for a long time for solving problems whose answers aren't known. And this is a place where a lot of people get very um, uh, confused or uh, dissuaded because <clears throat> since prior tests are published, it's really hard for some students and even some parents to get their heads around the idea that studying the past exams isn't the most efficient way to proceed. Okay, past exams have a place for sure, but that's not where you want to be learning. Another common misconception is that, oh, well, I'll just, I'll go on to AOPS, uh, artofproblemsolving.com, where all the wikis are, where all the past exams have been, you know, picked to get, picked to death and dissected and answered by nine different people and all that kind of good stuff. Again, Great resource. I love the AOPS guys for sure. But reading through other people's solutions to these problems doesn't help 
nearly as much as one thinks it does. And it's ironic because in calculus class, if you're one of these students, reading through the answers is helpful. Okay, but the nature of the problem is different. Let me give you an example. Let's take a, let's take a, a long list of numbers. We're gonna start with two and we're gonna count up by threes. So two, five, eight, 11, 14, 17, 20, blah, 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 blah. And the list just goes on and on and on. Let's just say it goes on forever. Okay, the kind of thing that the AMC would, would ask you is, okay, great. Well, you know the perfect squares, one, four, nine, 16, 25, the numbers that are some integer times itself. Okay, great. So we have this long sequence, two, five, eight, and so on. Okay, what's the smallest perfect square that's on this list? Okay, and it is possible to have researched the answer to this. That's a pretty bizarre little question to pick out of the universe of information, but like you could do it, okay? And if you've been through an undergrad number theory course, you know what the problem's really getting at, but almost no one who's taking this exam has been to an undergrad number theory course. The intention is not that in preparing for it, you learn all this number theory, although that, that can be a side effect. The intention is that you get sufficiently good at thinking about problems in general, that you approach it from a couple of different ways until you start to see a chink in the armor. If you go at it just, you know, if you go barreling down and go oh, two, five, eight, 11, four, two, sooner or later, I'll come up with them. And then you're counting up the list and pretty soon you start to doubt that there is one and how high do I need to go? And then you turn it around and you start counting up the perfect squares, one, four, nine, 16, 25, 36. And you're like, well, how would I tell if one of these numbers is on the other list? Okay. And before you know it, right? whatever else you're supposed to be doing kind of gets forgotten and you're kind of wandering around the neighborhood thinking about, wait, how do these things all work? But before long, you start to come to some underlying truths about the way these numbers work. And you start to see that, wait a minute, there's this pattern in the perfect squares that kind of doesn't match with the pattern of this other list. And as you're thinking about it, you are in effect teaching yourself an important number theory principle without reading a number theory book. Okay, how many high schoolers can say that they've learned something just from thinking about it? That's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Okay, then they've had that experience. Now, a student who's done that, a kid who's wandered around the neighborhood and who's come to the conclusion of like, you know what? I don't think there is a number on that. I think, I think when I get back home and I get pencil and paper, maybe I can prove it, right? Okay, guess what? That kid has just done math research. Okay, it may be math research that was done by somebody else, but that's not the point. The point is that is the experience of math research and we've done it just now. But again, you don't get that in your history class. You don't get that in your calculus class. It's different. So when you ask, what do we do, right? Mm -hmm. Around here at, at our little coaching firm, it really is about, okay, here's a collection of hard questions. Why don't you beat your head against this particular brick wall for a little while? Okay, see what happens, come up with some questions for the first time in a long time, maybe ever, have the experience of doubting whether you can simply brain it harder to come up with a solution, okay? Not, not a pleasant experience, but a good growth experience. And then come back to us and ask, ask us some specific questions about what you observed. And for the first time, maybe you got to start to learn the shape of your own mind at the limits of its ability. Okay, now we're doing something that's gonna make a difference years from now. So what I what I'm hearing from you is that perhaps a student's goal is to not get to the AI, and that uh, sort of success is really truly reserved for the extremely talented students. But that the actual process of preparing for the AMC eight, ten, or twelve, and really problem solving and understanding, as you say the limits of my own brain capacity and doing research and thinking about problems outside of sort of the linear model of what's going on in calculus. Yeah. To me, it seems like there's there's multiple benefits of, of thinking about this test or at least preparing for it. Is that a correct understanding? Is that incorrect? What are your sort of thoughts on that? That's certainly how, that's certainly how I think of it. I think that there's, um, there's, there's a lot of different values to this, depending on sort of what your goals are and, and, and what your level of ability is. And, and, and let's just face it, right? Your intrinsic interest in this stuff. But as you know really well, there are gonna be a, a bunch of folks who apply to any given top university who have a, a really impressive resume of having done certain things that are you know, the things one does. 
Okay. And one of the things that I like about Ingenious is that that you are strategic about thinking about, okay, you know, we don't want to just have another one of the things on the list. We're, you know, we're trying to trying to be smarter about this. And I think that this is one of the ways that that a student can be smarter about learning in a way that is level appropriate at high school, but is going to resonate with a more undergrad grad school type experience. If that makes sense, so, I, I got a little yeah. off topic there because I was so no, excited about the question. So, but so so let let let's take a look at that even closer. So I'm um <laughs> sure. you know I'm a I'm a eleventh grader and yeah. you know I've been immersed in sort of the math club at high school. Sure, I am taking um, calculus BC. I'm already advanced. Yep. Sure, and I have taken you know AMC eight, AMC yep. ten, and now I'm getting ready for AMC twelve. But I've really never gone beyond uh you know the test i've never qualified for the AME. yeah is, is there a point where i stop is there an opportunity cost to pursuing this and yeah. how should as a student i be thinking about amc in the context of other opportunities i can do and my time yeah so first of all there's always an opportunity cost Right. And I think it's 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 good to just acknowledge that as as parents and as coaches early on. There's always something else that you can be doing. Um, I think a big piece of how you think about, okay, where do I get off and 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 you know, where do I where do I stick with this path comes down to making uh, really good strategic choices. So for example, if you're an eleventh grader, you're taking calculus BC. For starters, last year you should have you should have taken the twelve instead of the ten. Most 11th graders in that situation, or I should say most 10th graders taking pre-calculus assume that they should be taking the AMC 10, but in fact, they should be taking the AMC 12, not only because they can, but because it admits people to the AME at a higher rate than the AMC 10 does. Okay, so you're, you're kind of tying a hand behind your back if you're assuming that as a 10th grader, you should be taking the AMC 10. There's some strategy there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think... Um, a piece of the answer, I know that, 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 that this is only going to be interesting to some of the folks in the room, but I think a piece of the answer really does come down to interest. I genuinely believe that if you find something, if you find that something inspires you, you will have more time, energy, and enthusiasm for it. It will sort of, in some sense, create time out of nothing. And I have certainly had students who just get into this stuff and it, it turns out to be a vehicle for them. We could make the argument that they should be doing some other thing, but they found something that lights them up. That doesn't happen every day. Let them run with it a little bit. But I think um, to get a little more brass tacks about it, I think that if you're preparing for these exams and you're finding that your performance is increasing as measured by a score, okay, on an every two or three weeks basis, right? You, let's say you're taking one or two practice tests a month on the side, in addition to whatever, it else, you're, what, whatever else it is you're doing. If those scores are going up, then you can be assured you are progressing and you're learning something that would be hard to learn any other way. And the only circumstance in which I would say, okay, it's time for you to do something else is if you have something else that is, um, that is as well regarded as this exam that teaches skills that are as important to you as this exam does. And that's, that's a pretty high bar. Okay. Remind, rem remind, remind our audience again. Or sure codify for our audience. What are those skills exactly that you're talking about? Sure. So I would, um, I divide them up into three categories. I, I just call them fluency, presence, and boldness. Okay. okay. And fluency is the easiest one to understand. This is, I know the material and, and this is the part that gets forgotten. I know how it connects together. So someone who's a master of fluency has not only read about the necessary math, of which there actually isn't a ton, but ha but is very playful with that math, understands how, um, how an algebra problem can be solved geometrically, how a geometry problem can be solved trigon trigonometrically, how a trigonometry problem could actually be a combinatorics problem. This sounds very highfalutin, but for really strong students at the high school level, this is trainable, okay? And many of them have flashes of this insight in their regular classes. So again, one of the three legs of the stool is just playing with this stuff and letting it get interconnected. It's, it's the difference between learning the vocabulary of some foreign language and actually getting practice telling jokes in the foreign language, 
Okay. We're learning to tell jokes in math here. We're having fun <laughs> with it. We're just, we're messing around. So that requires a real deep level of fluency. Okay. So we're learning, we're learning that. Uh, another piece that I mentioned is presence. Uh, so that's fluency. Presence is the awareness of where you are and how you are. Because so many of these students, again, ambitious, strong students, run themselves ragged all day long and don't realize when their mental blade is a little bit dull because their dull is still sharper than most of the people they run into all day, okay? <clears throat> but again, if you're gonna really be ambitious in life, you need to know the difference between my A game and my B plus game, which passes for an A game in most rooms. Right. Okay, right. so that's a piece of it. And what I find is a lot of these students do not have the skills of self-awareness, of, um, of um, self-guidance. Uh, in fact, many of them don't even have the skills to get their thoughts down on paper because they're so accustomed to solving problems in their head that when it comes time to write things down because finally they have a problem that's difficult enough that it requires that help, they don't even know what to write because they're not used to doing it. Right. Okay, so some of these are real basic skills. That's two. The third one, which I call boldness, what do you do when you don't know what you're doing? This is not just grit and determination. This is actually having um, a checklist, a cheat sheet for, okay, when, when I'm in the middle of the job interview and I find myself panicking, right, what's my next move? And like these questions have answers. There are well understood uh, techniques for getting yourself out of a difficult situation. I don't mean just emotionally difficult, of course. I'm talking about intellectually difficult. Okay, these are things like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reread the problem. Think about why they might have asked me this question, right? You, you hear all the time that, that, um, that these kids are, are good test takers in many cases, okay? Particularly if anxiety isn't a, isn't a chief concern for them. They're good test takers. What does that really mean? What it really means is they have the ability to look at the test from a bunch of different perspectives. Okay, and they're used to doing it for easy questions. They're not used to doing it for challenge, truly challenging questions. So this incents them to formalize that cheat sheet of, okay, what do I do in a mysterious situation when I don't really know what the answer is? So that when they're at a top undergrad program, that cheat sheet gets a lot of use. You know, you use, you use in your second category of yeah. fluency. Yeah. And quite frankly, I think that that is probably one of the greatest skills that a student can learn, which is understanding how what they're doing is actually applicable in real settings. And, you know, we're talking about the AMC today, um, but another sort of uh, exam or test that a lot of STEM students are going to pursue if they're interested in computer science is going to be the USACO. Oh yeah, you said coding on this, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And, That's the computer science equivalent correct. of maths AMC, sure. Yeah, and I and, and you know we, we get it in Genius. Uh, a lot of students who are saying like AMC, you know, I really want to get gold at USACO. I really want right. to get platinum, but you know, I'm spending so much time doing it. And at some point, you have to recognize that you know coding and math are simply tools to apply to something else and it's that's the fluency exactly right. of, you know it's the fluency of how do you use these in different circumstances that's right and for, and for you know students interested in computer science it's like well maybe instead of spending 100 hours preparing for USACO maybe you should go find a local animal shelter and see if you can update their volunteer platform and see yeah. if maybe you can measure that you <clears throat> coded a website that increased the number of hours donated you know, something yep. like that. Um, yep. You know, on, on that note, where we have sort of like the applied skill set or, you know, even sort of an interdisciplinary interest. Yep. You know, you're working with students on a hyper-specific test, the AMC. These, these are math kids. These are STEM at large kids. Yep. Where are you seeing your students sort of apply their interests elsewhere? What's oh, like God. A, so good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so like good. A, yeah, what's like an off-the-cuff case <laughs> that you can give me of a kid who's like, hitting home runs in math and then do using it for something else. Okay. So first of all, I've got to, I've got to just kind of contextualize this a little bit. Um, what's the number one um, critique that gets leveled against the kids we're talking about? It's that they're book smart. Yeah. They're math. They're kids. They're yeah. They're math kids. They're book smart. They don't know how to blah, blah, blah. 
Okay. They only know in this narrow, and that's like, <laughs> if it's true, that's, that's a, a, a legit criticism. Okay. <clears throat> but in, in diving into this area where they're comfortable and really learning about interconnection, we can't help but think about how does it connect out to some of the other things that are nearby, just like you were saying with USACO and volunteering your time and rewriting a, a, a computer program. In fact, um, one of the members of the team is actually a, a professor at CMU of CS who routinely gets students who show up at CMU having earned a five on the APCS exam, but who do not know how to code because they have some theoretical knowledge of algorithms, but they don't have any practical experience actually doing it. It's not like they have any shortage of computers in their home. They just haven't done it, okay? So the way in which this stuff plays out outside the math arena isn't stuff that's adjacent to math. I'm thinking one kid, oh God, this is gonna, this is gonna be a terrible example, but he was a Minecraft fiend, loved Minecraft. And I just thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be like pulling teeth. I'm I, like, I, I don't know anything about Minecraft and it doesn't sound interesting to me. But it, it turns out that when I say that this kid was into Minecraft, what he was really into was using Minecraft to teach like middle school students how to think, um, uh, what's the word, uh, logically and programmatically. Like they would build machines together in Minecraft. He would make Minecraft servers at local middle schools so that the kids could work on these skills and stuff like that, right? At first I was thinking, oh, here's a kid who just loves video games. It's like, no, he's using Minecraft as a language to teach these other kids and to, and to invite them to join this, you know, interesting environment that he found fascinating, right? Like, yeah, it's a little nerdy, but it's, um, he, 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 he found community, he created community and they found a thing that they could bond I, over. I, I think, you know. I think that's, I think that's super important. I mean, a lot of families will come to us and say, Matt, should I participate in this competition or Matt, Ooh. should I do this activity? Matt, what do you think is going to be the key to get into MIT? What's the secret sauce, Matt? Tell yeah, me how exactly. I, tell me what thing I need to Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 you know, the reality is, is, you know, at Ingenious, we have this strategy and the strategy is you need to make an argument to the colleges and you need to build up this idea of an application persona. Okay. By right. looking at my application, you see that I am a what? And right. the example you're giving is I am a systematic engineer focused on teaching logic to kids through games. And you're like, right. wow, that's great. You know, but where do we see that? Okay. Well, we see that academically with the grades you got and the classes you take. Yep. We see that extracurricularly with the clubs you started, the research you did, the summer programs you did, the impact project that you did. And then we see that kind of intellectually through your essays, but also in the competitions. I think yep. a lot of families sort of, as they're thinking about the competitions and they're thinking about college, kind of get a misunderstanding of how the application itself is presented. And okay. on, yeah. on the on the common application, every student has an opportunity to list 10 activities, which they can qualify and quantify. They can qualify it by describing their role, where they did it, what they did, and they can quantify it by talking about how long they did it for years, weeks, hours, and then what their measurable impact was. For example, I recruited 25 students to the Minecraft club and we did a thousand hours of logic training. But yeah. You know, the, the, the AMC or the AIME or the USACO, that's not an activity. That's reserved for the honors and awards section, which acts, like you were saying earlier, as a credential or yeah. another notch on the belt to really yeah, I see what you mean. Put, put the student on a pedestal academically and maybe also even a little bit of intellectually. But what a lot of families, a lot of students are missing is like preparing for these competitions. It's not an activity that's measured as an activity by the yeah. colleges. Right, so, it's a credential, it's an award, it's a thing you did. They're not gonna give you points for spending longer doing this. If anything, they're correct. gonna give you points for getting it done more quickly. Correct, whereas there are points for spending longer mm -hmm. uh, you know, on, on your research, and, on your community yeah. service, sure, on sure, your sure. independent project, et cetera, yeah. I think one of the things, one of the places uh, that, that there's this really strong intuitive crossover, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to express it, but I'm gonna give it a, a fair shot, is that, um, so, uh, so many of the interesting activities that students do that is part of their college application is outside their comfort zone. It's, it's in their growth zone, 
right? And I think a piece of what makes the AMC and the USACO and these, and these other competitions so interesting is that it forces students to get out of their comfort zone while, re while retaining the semblance of being in a thing that they identify as being their core skill. Okay, so yeah, we're doing math, but we're not doing math you've seen before. So we still have to kind of shove you a little bit or drift you a little bit out of your comfort zone because that's where you're really going to grow. One of the big problems that I see with these kids is they don't want to explore because they've had so much success staying close to their um, strength. Yeah. Right. And I think what you're what you're pointing out is that that for some of these kids, that exploration in your intellectual growth zone can lead to can lead to other kinds of growth, can lead to, you know what, I'm going to try this other thing that I normally wouldn't try just to see how it works out. It's interesting. It's interesting because, you know, again, we work with, like you guys, we worked with extremely talented and gifted yeah. students. And um, a lot of students are sort of of the misunderstanding that their work, for example, their research or their sort of uh, the clubs that they started or their impact project yeah. are going to be, you know, tremendously meaningful to the world. Okay. And, sure. you know, the reality is, is, you know, particularly for a student who is participating in high school research, you okay. have the high school student, you have the bachelor's of arts mm -hmm. student, you have the master's, you have the PhD, you have the postdoc, you have the doctorate, you, and then that, that right. doesn't even address the commercial space. That's just the academic. Space. Yeah, sure. So right. you're really low man on the totem pole, but the reality is, is that the students who are rewarded in the admissions process are the ones who are taking risks. They're the ones who are trying to extend past their comfort zone and trying to get other people to buy in around an idea that they care about and exploring it to upskill themselves, which yep. is in many ways, you know, what you were talking about earlier is like, you know, the process of doing the AMC or the process of doing some of these research projects or independent projects is almost the value itself. Yeah. When, when I got into MIT back in, again, in the 1700s, right? It wasn't this hard. Okay. Yeah. As, as we all know, right? Like would I get into MIT today? Mm, would, wouldn't go betting a lot of money on it. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and like, and well, the if, story if, if you, if you worked with us, we'd, Exactly. That's a different, that's a different situation. <laughs> of course. Thank goodness I've got friends in high places because otherwise I'd be in some trouble. But I think the point you're making is it's really important because what you're, what you're pointing out is that the very thing that these admissions committees are interested in seeing is in some sense, the opposite of what we train these kids to focus on most of the day, mm -hmm. right? Because on one hand, there's, I want to see you take risks. I want to see you get outside your comfort zone. I want to see you growing. And they're in an environment where it's like, oh boy, you better not get an A minus, better stick with the comfortable thing and make sure you get the thing that we expect you to get. And that's a difficult tightrope for anyone to walk. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of, difficult. yeah, exactly. A lot of the pressure that a lot of these kids are under comes from recognizing that tension. And um, I think that it's enormously valuable if you can give, give a kid at least the beginnings of a path lets him or her meet both of those opposite goals simultaneously without driving themselves crazy. Right. Right. That's the power of, of expert consulting. Right. Um, all right. Hey, Wes, I'm going to go to the Q and a. Oh yeah. A, yeah. Let's do that. Second, yeah, 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 we totally. do have two. Um, okay. Question number one, and guys, keep in mind, uh, we do have a lot of participants on the line. If you do have any questions, please drop them in the Q and a chat box. And uh, both Wes and I are going to try our best to answer. Yeah, and just um, to make you, sure everyone's everyone's clear, if you're looking at your like your full size Zoom window, there's a row of buttons across the bottom. There's a green share screen button, and near near there, there's a Q and A button. And if you click that button, then you can you can type a question that we can see, and we're happy to answer them. Right. And again, if you guys do have personal questions that you would wish not to be shared in a sort of a, a webinar format, uh, please do schedule a consultation with um, Cynthia, and we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. um, okay, question number one is for a child with ADHD having a 504 IEP plan, does this disability negatively affect their admission? Ooh, um, that's a so, good one. So the question at large is how do colleges evaluate or work with neurodiverse students? And the, the reality is, is that 
students who have some level of neurodiversity, wherever that falls, are in all types of colleges. Like an example is I was working with a student this year uh, who is neurodiverse, who last week just got into Yale. It's not a disability of cannot do. It's an, a disability of how can I channel the resources around me to get organized, to make sense of what's in front of me to the degree that I know I can do. Um, you know, at Ingenious, we work with um, several neurodiverse students. Uh, we also are uh, in a partnership with an organization called Goal Oriented Academics that specializes in working with neurodiverse students. So if that's a you know, particular case that you want to talk about, we're certainly welcome to have that conversation. Um, but from sort of the college admissions perspective, um, you know, every student has a fair shot. And frankly, the students who are able to maintain their high academic standards, do really cool things extracurricularly, take leadership positions, dive deep into a research project or some sort of uh, project or add credentials to their belt like an AIME, they're gonna be evaluated just the same. Um, but yeah, to, to answer directly, does it affect their admissions? Um, like every student, it's a student's responsibility to make an argument of why they should take a spot at that college. And you have to serve up evidence to persuade the admissions officer to let you in. And every student is mm -hmm. sending the same type of application. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is, uh, number one, is it a problem not to participate in AIME if qualified in AO's eyes, since getting a meaningful good score is hard? Um, I th think the question is probably, is it a problem not to participate in AMC if qualified in the AO's eyes? Because the AO actually doesn't render qualifications for the jump between AMC or AI. Uh, so I'm going to interpret that question that way. So that would probably be a student who is interested in majoring in math or some other STEM subject mm -hmm. who is in a who has exhausted their math curriculum at the high school, which could mean AP Calculus BC. It could mean multivariable. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And a student who says, I love math. Um, I, I'm going to toss this actually over to you, Wes. Like, sure. You know, AMC really has become a badge for math kids. Yep, it has. If I'm a math kid and I'm, I don't want to take the AMC, what implications does that have? Well, it can have it can have a couple of different implications. Um, first of all, I, I really encourage people to think of this as as winners only. Okay, this is not it's not a you get penalized if you don't do it kind of situation. There are a couple of reasons for that, but but so far that that's been the history of the exam, and it doesn't show signs of changing. Um, and I think a piece of that is that AOs understand that the AMC is related to other skills and is related to math research and is related to adult skills of competence, extreme competence, but only in a, only in a way that is right for some of the kids who want those skills. One great example that comes to mind uh, stems from the fact that the AMC is a 75 minute exam. Okay. Not all bright kids think quickly. And the AMC selects for the ones who are both bright and quick. Okay. So if I'm if I'm a deep thinker, but I'm a little bit dreamy, or I, you know, I I'm a little perfectionist, or I'm I'm simply not fast. I I think very well, but I have to take my time. The AMC isn't a good option for me. Now, luckily, um, the MAA, which runs the AMC, uh, and some of its sister organizations have other options. One of the ones that comes to mind is a is a competition called the USAMTS, which is um, of a, 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 a parallel difficulty level to the AMC. It's actually a little harder than the AMC, but there's no real time constraint. It's administered in a way that allows people to think more deeply over a long period of time. And that's that's not the only example. USACO is another example of a, of a thing that does it in a different way. There, there are countless options. So the AMC is probably the sort of the, the crown jewel in the TR, if you will, right? It's very well known. It's very well understood. But there are a lot of small gems that the top AOs are also familiar with. And tell me if I'm wrong, Matt, but I would imagine that if I'm an AO and I'm looking at a kid's application and, and what they have successfully framed and communicated to me is, look, 
I'm competitive with these folks who are taking the AMC, but I know myself well enough to know that that's a better way to showcase my abilities. Like to me, it's like, great, super strong yeah. student who also knows what he's doing. Yeah, so we actually got clarification on the question. Uh, thank you, oh, great. CT. Um, so the question actually was, if qualifying oh, was. for the AIME and not choosing to take it, is that going to be a knock from the AO perspective? And the answer See, is going, go ahead, Wes. I, I mean, it comes back to what you said earlier, I think, yeah. Matt, about uh, about opportunity cost. Yeah, the answer, right? is, the answer, is, the answer is no. Um, because at the point where you've already gone from the AMC and qualified for the AIME, you're already in the top 1%. I imagine it's even top 0.01%. I don't know yeah, the exact. Yeah, you've, you've got a gold star on your, yeah, for sure. You've, you've got a gold star. You have the credential. Um, and now we have to talk about opportunity cost. In in no circumstance um, are AOs kind of curious. They might be curious why you didn't take the next step, but I actually, within the context of how admissions officers read applications, which by the way, will be in about five minutes, I don't think that what's coming into their mind is the question of if a student qualified for AIME, why didn't they do it? What they're looking for is, okay, the kid crushes his academics. He's got his 1550 plus on the SAT. He's got AMC 8, 10, and 12 qualified for AIME. He's got this other competition. Okay. He's in the math club. He did research looking at sort of building bridges. He's got this other thing. And what are his essays about? Why does he want to come to our, our college? Yeah. And this kind of gets to the original point of, you know, we, we, and we asked Wes to, you know, work with us and we want to know where the AMC and these types of credentials play in the entire kind of admissions application. And the answer is very simply, it plays a role, but it is sort of like adding a cherry on top of an ice cream sundae. It's for the students who are already demonstrating that they're admissible academically. It's yeah. for the students who are already demonstrating that they'd be a good fit for the math program or an engineering program or something related. So once students pass that threshold of, can the student be successful academically at our college? AMC falls in that question. It might propel somebody to the higher yeses in that mm -hmm. question, but mm -hmm. everything else matters. I'll give you, uh, if we're talking numbers, I'll give you a, a, an objective example. University of Chicago, when I was working there a few years ago, I uh, got 36,000 applications. Mm -hmm. Of 36,000 applications, 18,000 of them pass the threshold of admissibility. They can do the work. Okay? They demonstrated they got good grades in, in high school. They got a good test score. They had all these other credentials. Of those 18,000 students, only 2,000 got in. So the question isn't, how do I go from the 36 to the 18? The question is, how do I go from the 18 to the 2? And that's where we get into... What activities are the students doing? What value are they adding to their community beyond their classroom? What research have they participated in? What, what are their teachers or some of their research mentors have to say about them? What sort of project the other how many ever thousand students are doing the AMC? Because ultimately, like if we think about it from a macro level and we look at, let's say, Columbia University. Columbia University emits 5% of their kids. That means one in 20 get in. One goes this way, 19 go this way. Of the 19 go this way who are applying to math, many of them have taken uh, the AMC and many of them have qualified for the AIME. The one that goes this way probably also has done, but has so much more as part of their application uh, that cannot be captured just by a credential. Um, it's it's so also worth of, pointing out that the number yeah. of students who qualified for the AME in any given year is on the order of, I don't know, three, four, maybe 5,000 nationwide, yeah. right? You know, of the 36,000 applying to UChicago, even if every single person who was invited to take the AME, it's still rarefied air, yeah, it's right? So, rare. so it's like, did you take the AME? Why didn't you take the AME? It's like, no, you got the gold star. You're in the special pile. Uh, so another, another question from CT, um, is it worth applying for a competitive summer program, mainly for rising seniors, but a few selected rising juniors uh, will be admitted. Will a fail to get selected record have a negative impact on getting selected at the next level next year? Uh, the answer is no, no, the answer is no. Um, very, uh, they might look at the applications if they use a CRM. You know, all admissions offices use some sort of CRM. The majority of them use one called Slate. 
if the summer programs are tied to the university, then they might also use Slate, which gives them an easy access to look at previous applications. Um, but if I were talking with a student and I and they were talking to me about summer programs, I would say, okay, let's target a handful of summer programs. Uh, some of them are going to be sort of the really difficult to get into, like the Clark Summer Program, a re big research project. And then I would pick a few others that are a little bit more targety or or safety. And I would give my best effort to apply to them. If I get in, great. If I don't, then I might target that for the next summer. But I don't think that a student's going to be punished for shooting his shot. Uh, next question is, um, following up on the neurodiversity, should the student let the college know in the essay in your experience? Only if the student wants the AO to know about it from their lens. So a student can submit inform any information that they want, right? A lot of families think that the application is a, a buffet. Here's all the things that I've ever done. But no, it's actually really a curated meal where you are giving the AO a taste of the best that you can do. And... That means that you're in control of what you say in the essays, you're in control of how you present the information in the activity list. It also means that you're in control of who you ask to write your letters of recommendation. So you ask your teachers and also your counselors. And at Ingenious, we advise students to write letter of recommendation cover letters, which give information that you would like your teachers or counselors to share in a very strategic way. If a student who wants to talk about their neurodiversity in any way, okay? As in, it is a challenge that I had overcome or it's made me think way differently than all my peers. So I address problems much differently and that's provided me success versus a total other range. It just depends on the package that you're presenting. If a student comes to me and says, I'd like to present this information, I say, great, let's find the best possible way to do it and the most effective way to do it. I never recommend students shy away from anything like that. Uh, but again, it, it definitely is a choice. Can I just throw in a, a quick uh, anecdote? Um, the last person you would want project managing your team at work is someone with ADHD as a general rule, right? Because they're not going to have the kind of disciplined approach you want. One of the most successful project managers I know identifies as having ADHD. Why? because the way she came to deal with her own neurodiversity gave her a basket of skills that her so-called peers simply don't have access to. And so she's become more effective as a result of that experience. That's a, that's a way of framing something that an AO, I wouldn't think would just automatically see, but with guidance right. like that, okay, you can frame it in that way. Yeah, and, and you know, we'll, we'll end on this because we're kind of at the top of the hour and mm -hmm. I'm going to reshare my screen so we can get to um, our QR codes and whatnot. But, yeah. but, I, but I, I will reshare, you know, some information that is, you know, the admissions process is, is not a test. It's not the ACT. It's not the, <laughs> uh, you know, AMC. It is an opportunity for you to present yourself and persuade a person that you are going to be a great member of that school. And literally people read these applications and people will have different sort of alphanumeric grading systems that they have to follow. All these colleges have different institutional priorities. So for example, if the college has a band, a tuba player graduates, they need to find another tuba player. But the reality is, is that it's the student's responsibility to persuade a person to admit them. And that person has emotions, that person has feelings, that person has ideas. Um, so the more authentic and the more persuasive and the more true you can be, the more effective you're going to be in this entire process. And that's just the reality situation. Mm -hmm. And to sort of wrap up, you know, with where we're at is like, from my perspective, you know, the AMC is potentially great for two reasons. Number one, it's a tremendous credential or number two, it's one heck of a learning process that really shows you the limits to your abilities. And if you don't view it as one of those two things and you're really getting frustrated, trying and banging your head against the wall, maybe let's go find some other opportunities to go sure. explore your interests in sort of the quantitative fields. Um, Wes, I wanna thank you for participating. Uh, it was a real pleasure. 
If anybody would like to schedule a one-to-one -one consultation with me at Ingenious Prep, please add Cynthia on WeChat or email her at cynthia.yang at ingeniousprep.com. We'll be able to schedule those consultations this week, next week, and then after the new year. Uh, and then if anybody would like to find out more information about working with Wes, please go to westcarroll.com slash start or follow his uh, QR code. Um, we will be having more webinars with Wes in the coming year. Um, and if anybody has any questions for us about college admissions or AMC or for Wes about AMC or any of his other tutoring services, I'm sure that both parties would be willing to talk about them. So for sure. Thanks uh, again very Matt, much. Yep. Matt and Cynthia, thank you so much for organizing this. I really can't thank you enough for making it all possible. And I want to assure anyone who's considering uh, scanning this QR code and getting in touch with me, I'm happy to meet a new person and spend 20 minutes answering whatever questions you have. Uh, I don't have a high pressure sales process. I'm just interested in helping people become more effective in this particular narrow area where I have a specialty. Thanks, Wes. We'll talk to you soon. Bye, Thanks guys. so much, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.